today I want to just talk to you from the subject suffering life's losses suffering life's losses we have all been through a lot of losses in our life uh, 2020 has not been uh, so kind to a lot of people and the, the fact of the matter is is we have been through losses before we ever embraced 2020 and you know so for some it's just loss upon loss and today I want to just speak to your heart and I want to give you some things on uh, that I believe things I've put into practice that I believe will help you as they have helped me when we start going through losses in life father today I thank you for the privilege God of just being able to worship you to be able to break the bread and feed the flock that have pulled their chair up to their computer or to your table today and I pray God that you will let this word find every man every woman every boy every girl every believer every non-believer I pray God that your word will be effective today use me to declare it among the nations and I'll give you thanks for it in Jesus name amen and amen Today we're going to talk about loss because that's where a lot of people have been. 20, somebody said the other day, what has 2020 been? And I said, well, it's been a year of sobering. It's been a year of sobering. It has definitely got our attention. And I don't think that there will be uh, many of us who will forget 2020 anytime soon because a lot of people have suffered loss they have suffered loss upon loss lost loved ones lost family uh, lost jobs lost housing uh, lost income so many people have suffered loss and it is sobering when you begin to stop and realize that there is absolutely nothing that is around you that is permanent nothing that is around you is permanent, that, that is sobering like there. And uh, it is an honest fact that if we live long enough that we will all experience some kind of season of loss in our life, seasons that will uh, take away things that were very important to us, things like your job, things like your family, things like your health. Uh, things like relationships that you thought you could always count on. Uh, it will take away your peace. It'll take away earthly possessions, uh, your family, your marriage. At, at some point, um, even many of us have and will experience the death of someone that we really loved and cared about and we held deeply in our hearts. And uh, many of you have found yourself in these situations and you're trying to cope your way through or you're trying to grieve your way through this very kind of loss that I'm talking about right here in the year of 2020. Now, um, if, if that's not where you are today, I want to encourage you to lean in, listen close, and take good notes because at some point, I promise you, in your life, you are going to need the things I'm going to tell you today. If it is you, then for sure, lean in, listen close, and take good notes because I'm going to try to give you five keys today that I believe will help you as you suffer life's losses. Now, it is obvious to, to most of us, I'm not going to say all of us, but I am going to say to most of us, it's obvious that life isn't fair. It's obvious that life isn't a fairy tale where everybody is going to end up happily ever after. Ecclesiate, uh, I'm sorry, Ecclesiastes 8 and 14 in the New Century Version says it like this. Sometimes something useless happens on earth. Bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people. And such is life. We have all seen that. And, and before I really get, get into giving you those five keys that I think you're going to need, I want to just, I want to say a couple things to you. One of those uh, things that I want to say is that we often have a tendency that when bad things happen to us, we think that we are bad. 
And we also have a tendency that when, to think that when good things happen to us, it's because of our own goodness. But in all actuality, neither one of those, um, are, those statements that I just made are true. Uh, when good things happen to us in life, it is called grace. It is called the grace of God. And when bad things happen to us, it is life and it is just what we have to go through. So um, somebody says, well, why is it like that? And I'll tell you why it's like that. Because we live in a world that is broken. Our world is broken. It's been broken by sin. And as a result, we have all kinds of things that are happening. Um, our world is broken. And, and because of that, things don't always go uh, in the direction that we have planned for them to go. So there will be times, that even if you're a believer, there will be times uh, where bad things might happen in your life. Uh, and, and a lot of times, those things are not your own fault. Now, granted, there are times that we reap things because we sowed them, but sometimes um, we will be stuck facing things uh, in life and we are innocent in them and we are somewhat victims to them. And sometimes we're going to hurt and we don't deserve it and we're going to cry and we really shouldn't have to and we're going to face losses that, that are completely unexplainable. Such is life and we need to know that. The second thing that we need to know uh, is that every Everything that happens in our lives is not necessarily the will of God. You can just turn on the news and, and watch people uh, see story after story where people are struggling. We see innocent children, innocent elder, elderly people. We see babies. We see uh, uh, all kinds of people suffering at the hands of abusive people or, or systems that they have found themselves locked into. And someone uh, might just say, well, that must just must be the will of God for their lives. Are you kidding me? That is not the will of God. And here's, how, here's why I'll tell you that, because God is not the author of evil. I said, God is not the author of evil. He is not the author author of division. He is not the author of a lot of things that we are seeing happen in our world today. Now, many people would like to try and blame God uh, for the terrible things that are happening in our lives, but do not blame God because God is grieved as much as you and I are, if not worse than we are. Somebody says, well, couldn't he stop all of it? Couldn't he stop racism? Couldn't he stop crime? Couldn't he stop murders? Couldn't he stop uh, shootings of innocent and people, of course he could. He's God. He could take the freedom away, uh, 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 the, the freedom to choose away from uh, people that are evil, and they would never be able to do that again. But to be fair, if he took it away from people that were evil, he'd have to take your freedom to choose away too. He would have to take my freedom away too. And 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 so God, here's the truth: God has a will for our lives. He's got a will for your life. He's got a will for my lives, but my life. But the problem is that too many times we choose our will over top of his will. And when we choose our will over top of his will, people are going to suffer. And make sure that you write this down today. God will not force his will upon your life. His will tells us that, 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 that he, he, he wills for none of us to perish, but for all of us to come uh, to repentance. And yet that is not happening. It's his will, but it is not happening. Because why, Pastor Brady? Because the choice is obviously ours to make. We have to make the right choice. Why? because his will is not always done. And that's why when we pray, we pray, Father, let your kingdom come and let your will be done. That's what I found myself praying lately. God, let your will be done on earth. Why? Because his will is, per what, whatever you're doing in heaven, God, let it be done on earth. Why do you say that? Because in heaven, everything is perfect, uh, but it's not all 
always that way on earth. So as a result, we end up facing hurt and we, we face pain and we face loss and we face crisis. But God, in, in the middle of all of that, he is a good God and he gives us a word and he gives us hope that we can handle the losses of life that we find ourselves having to face. And today, I want you to write these things down because I believe that these keys are going to help you like I have experienced in my own life. I believe they will help you as you face whatever you have lost in life. Here's the first key. Number one, when you find yourself facing losses in life, number one, release the grief. Release the grief. I know firsthandedly that loss can produce very strong emotions. And when you've been through any kind of, of, of a major loss, there is all kinds of emotions. You've got emotions like anger. You've got emotions like fear and worry and sadness. And sometimes even you have to deal and you struggle with grief. And whenever there has been a loss that has been suffered, whether it's the loss of a career or a spouse or a way of life, or maybe it's the loss of your freedom or your identity or the loss of a dream or a business or a home or a family member that you used to talk to every day and now you can't pick up the phone and just call them like you have always called them. When we go through things like that, emotions start rising up inside of us and if we don't face them and if we don't feel them and if we don't deal with them, then ultimately it's going to take us longer to recover from our losses. But, and here's why, because if you, if you start stuffing what you should be facing, then, then there's going to be all kinds of war that's going on inside of you. And some of you today are struggling with unreleased grief that is inside of you. You've pushed it down or you've tried to, to pretend like it wasn't there or you've had to be strong for everybody else that's in your family. You tried to act like maybe maybe this isn't real or, or maybe, maybe I, I'm just gonna keep pushing it to the side, but you gotta stop pushing it to the side because ever how long you push it to the side, that's how long it's going to take for real healing to come into your life. That's why some of you right now are still struggling from losses that happened 20, 30, 40 years ago because let me say this, you will only heal as you allow yourself to feel. So you have to allow yourself to feel what you lost if you want to be healed from the loss that you've experienced. Some people try and they, they go through a loss and they try to take a very deep route. And, and they say things like, you know, well, I'm just going to suck it up because God would not be pleased if I just let myself break down like this. Or, or they would say, I am too spiritually strong. I've got too much word in me to be so overtaken with grief or, or to, go through, to go through and be weak when I should be being strong. And others would say, well, I think I'm just going to plaster a smile on my face and say, praise the Lord all the time. God is good and God is good all the time. And, and we think that God will be angry with us if we allow our real emotions to surface. But let me, can I help somebody today? Listen, whether you have lost a grandparent to Alzheimer's, a parent to COVID-19, a brother to cancer, a sister to drugs, whatever you have lost, if you have, have, have had to deal with the, the betrayal of a friend, or the stabbing in the back by someone who called you uh, 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 the, your, your brother when in all reality they were your enemy. God does not expect us to have to go through all of those kind of things and just smile our way through it. As a matter of fact, Jesus taught the exact opposite in Matthew chapter 5 when he said, blessed are those who not smile, but those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Here's what I want to tell you today. Grief is a gift from God that helps us to cope with the losses that we are feeling with in life, feeling and dealing with in life. Let me say it again. 
Grief is a gift from God that helps us as we cope with the losses that we are dealing with in life. I wanna ask you today, what are you doing with your feelings? How are you, how are you coping? Are you facing them or are you fleeing from them? Your grief has got to be released. If you don't shout today, I'm okay with that because I want to give you something that I believe will help you make it through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and on into the weeks to come. I want to tell you, if you have grief in you, it has got to be released. Don't repress it. Don't rehearse it over and over and over. You've got to release that. How do I do that, Pastor Brady? Well, you, you give it to God and you cry out to him and you tell him how you really feel. Listen, you're not impressing God if you're standing in his presence with a fake smile on your face because he knows you. He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows you inside and out. So you might as well come to him and say, God, my heart is broken. I don't know how to take it. I don't know how to face it. I don't know where I'm going to turn and I'm really struggling with what is happening in my life. Pour your heart out to him in prayer and believe for a breakthrough. Breakthroughs are available today. Don't let anybody tell you breakthroughs are not available. Break Breakthroughs are available. Well, how do you get them? You pray for them. You pray for breakthroughs in your life and in the life of your family and in the lives of those that you love. You pour your heart out to God and you get honest and you get very real. David did and he told us in Psalm 62 in verse 8, pour your heart out to God because he is your refuge. He is your refuge. God is your strength. He is your fortress. He's your strong tower. He is your hiding place. He said in Psalms 34 and 18 that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in their spirit. So pour your heart out to God. If you have a loss that you are grieving any kind of way, any kind of loss in your life, let it out, release it, pour it out to God. Don't take it out in anger on other people, but turn to a prayer closet somewhere. Pour your heart to God. Don't just push it down, but push it up to the place that can actually get some help. And why am I saying that? Because grief that is stuffed is grief that is not processed. So we have got to release the grief because if we don't, if we don't uh, release it, then I'm telling you if, you, if you, if you don't grieve right, you will not heal right. And it is important if God has given you tomorrow, it is important for you to be able to live it, to seize it, and to do whatever he has assigned you to do in your tomorrow. But you will not be ready if we don't release the grief. So key number one, when you're suffering losses in life, is release the grief. Second key, receive from others. Receive from others. Now, uh, for many of us, receiving doesn't always feel normal because we are used to, to being on the giving side. And it's much more easier for us to, to be giving than it is for us to be receiving. However, the Bible clearly tells us in Galatians 6 and 2, bear ye one another's burdens. The Living Bible says in Hebrews 12 and 15, Look after each other so that not one of you fail to find God's best blessings. Look after each other. Now, receiving from others, uh, it, it, it could, for, for many of us, it could go against our nature. Whenever we experience loss and hurt and grief and we find ourselves being set back in life, we have a tendency to withdraw and a tendency to build up walls and a tendency to pull back and to isolate ourselves because the pain is so real. But listen, the, the Bible tells us that that is the exact opposite of what 
we should be doing. So whenever we are facing loss, we not only need the support of others, we need the perspective of others. Because let me tell you what loss does. Loss causes pain. And pain narrows your focus. And when your focus is narrowed, you cannot see the big picture. But you need to be able to see the big picture. And when you can't see it, those that are around you might have a better perspective and they will help you with your perspective. So God has wired us to need each other. We need each other when times are good, and we also need each other when times are not so good. Let people in. Let people minister to you. Let people help you. Let people comfort you. Let people offer you suggestions. Allow people to sit with you and allow them to grieve with you. And don't feel embarrassed about it because this is one of the reasons that God created the church. We are a family. We are connected. We are called to care for each other. We are called to pray for one another. We are called to watch out for each other. We are called to look out for each other. So that's why, that's why for years I've been saying in this church, why don't you get plugged in? Become a volunteer. Get connected. Make sure that you know somebody in this church because I know and I still know that there will be days ahead that we are going to need one another. So what we need to do is we need to build those relational bridges with other people before we face the inevitable losses that we face in life. Look after, he said, look after each other so that not one of you will fail to find God's best blessings. And when we face losses, somebody said, well, I'm just going to stand on the promise. I'm just going to hide out over here and I'm going to stand on the promise. Well, I'm, I'm with you that we, we do need to stand on God's promise. We need God's promises when we go through losses. But I'm going to tell you something else we need. We need God's people. We are wired to need one another. So in order to, to survive the losses that we face in life, we have to release the grief. That's the first key on your keychain. The second key on your keychain is we need to receive from others. Others. Number three, write this down. We must refuse to become bitter. We must refuse to become bitter. When we have went through loss, it's so easy for us to become bitter. If anybody in scripture had a right to be bitter, it would be a man by the name of Job. Job said in Chapter 21 and verse 25, some people have no happiness at all. They live and they die with bitter hearts. And guess what? You and I have to decide whether we are going to be bitter in life or whether we are going to be happy in life because you cannot do both. You cannot be bitter and happy at the same time because when bitterness moves in your heart, happiness finds the nearest exit. And you and I are the one who gets to decide which one of those two will occupy and become the tenant of our heart. In every situation in life, you have got to decide. I've got to decide. Am I going to be happy in this or am I going to be bitter in this? Have, have you ever noticed like when, when major tornadoes or hurricanes hit certain cities and certain neighborhoods, they, the news channels will always be out there to interview people as they're going through their losses. And the sharp 
contrast, uh, the, the stark contrast between people that lived right next door to each other uh, can be amazing because one person says, well, you know, at least we got out with our life. You know, we can buy all this other stuff. We can, we can rebuild later, but at least we got out with our life. And then you hear another neighbor who might say, that's it. I'm tired. I'm quitting. I'm through. I don't know why that this happened, but I'm going to tell you something. It's all about perspective. Perspective. And we have got to learn that it is, it's our choice. We either are, decide to be happy in, in the situation or, or we decide to totally quit. But there, there, I'm going to tell you today, there is really, in really, there should be no correlation between our happiness and our circumstance, especially when we know Jesus. You know, and I know people who have had a hard time all of their life. They came up, they used to sing the rough side of the mountain. They had to fight for everything. They had to fight for education. They had to fight to put food on the table. Had to fight to get their kids uh, all the way through school. Had to fight to get the job. Had to fight on the job. Had to fight to keep the job. I mean, it looked like everything was against them, but what they did was they took the hand that they were dealt and they won with that hand. It wasn't a good hand, but they found a way to be a winner with it. And then we have other people who are handed everything like on a silver platter and all they do is wake up and whine and cry every day they never have enough this they never have enough that and instead of rise and shine they rise and whine every day of their life I guess they didn't hear the 11th commandment that said thou shalt not whine but we have people that do that all the time I, I can't I can't take being around whiny people if if you go whine you need to go somewhere and whine by yourself because I got too much to be grateful for. I've got too much to be thankful for, and I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. I might feel down for a moment, but I'm not going to take it out on people that are around me because I don't want that whining spirit to get in the atmosphere. I pull it down. I seize it, and I say, spring up, oh well, that's in my soul. You have got a whole lot of things to be thankful for today. So we can be happy or we can wine. And I say, somebody says, well, Pastor Brady, you don't understand because I've got real problems. I, I do understand real problems. I've had real problems too. But do you know that there are other people who would love to have your problems? They would love to have to pay a mortgage payment. They don't have a roof over their head. And they would love to know that they had a mortgage payment that they could pay. They would love to know that they could make a car payment. They would love to know that when they go to the doctor that they have to pay a co-payment where we might fuss about that but other people would be like Lord I wouldn't know I'd be so happy if all I had to do was pay a co-payment there are other people that would be like uh, uh, I'm tired I live on the third floor and I got to carry all these groceries up to the third floor do you know that there are other people that would be so happy to carry groceries up to the third floor other people are saying God I don't know how I'm going to feed my children it's all about a matter of perspective. I was watching this week uh, in, in Houston where they were evicting families, uh, families with small children. They evicted this one family and the guy, he walks out, his two little kids, he's got, well, they got one on the hip and they got one that's little and that one was walking and, and they were walking out and I was thinking, well, I guess they're just going to go get in their car. Uh, but then they really, they told us they didn't have a car and the camera showed them with their stroller with two babies walking down a street, no idea where they're going to go. I'm grateful that our, com that the community and people pitched in together and started trying to help people in those situations. Situations. But I'm just saying all that to say that you can take a look at somebody else and say, Lord, I, I'm going to get my perspective right and I'm going to give you thanks because somebody would be happy to deal with my problems. You know, there was that old phrase that said, I complain about having no shoes until I met somebody that didn't have any feet. And when you start looking at life like that, it'll make you stop and say, you know what? In the name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you for what I do have. I may not ever have everything I want to have and I may not even have everything
everything that I need to have. But Lord, I trust you. Somebody is much worse than I am. Let me tell you something. Bitterness, if you're not careful and you don't get it out of your spirit, it will make you selfish. Bitterness will make you selfish. It will make you self-serving. It will make you self-centered. But let me tell you something else it will do. It will make you spiritually sick. Hebrews 12 says, watch out that no bitterness take root among you. It causes deep trouble, hurting many people in their spiritual lives. Bitterness is after your spirit. Let me say that again. Bitterness is after your spirit, especially when you have gone through losses. And when we allow bitterness to, to be a part of our life, when we, when we open up the door and we allow bitterness to come in, then what we end up doing is we end up actually hurting ourselves. Well, you don't know what they did to me. If you knew what they did to me, let me tell you something. I may not know, but there's a God that knows and if they were wrong put them in the hands of God and let God deal with it own what you got to own though quit pushing your stuff off on everybody else acting like you ain't done anything let me tell you something let a man examine himself and say God how did I get where I am and if you'll examine yourself and straighten up your heart God will help you get out of the mess that you are in and I'm gonna tell you life like People are going to hurt us. People are going to hurt us both intentionally and they're going to hurt us unintentionally. But when we attempt to get vengeance ourselves, God washes his hands and he walks away from the matter. And he says, we ain't both fitting to fight this. You go fight it or I'm going to fight it. And it's better to leave it in the hands of God. God, and here's how you know when you're not bitter anymore. When you can take what you've been through and you feel like you've been wrong and you can take that and put it in the hands of God and walk away and you're not driven by that 24 seven. That is a sign that that bitterness is coming out of your spirit and you have got to get it out of you. There are two ways that we can refuse to become bitter. One is we've got to accept what cannot be changed, except what cannot be changed. Job said in 11 and 16, he said in the Good News Translation, put your heart right, Job. Reach out to God. Put away evil and wrong from your home. Then face the world again, firm and courageous. Yeah, Job. You've been through some losses, but I want you to get your heart right. I want you to cry out to God. And if you will do that, then I will help you face the world again. And when you face it, you'll face it with, with courage. You'll face it with assurance and know that God has got you and it's going to be all right. So one of the marks of real maturity is that you begin to realize that life is out of your control. Life is out of your control. And sometimes the only way that we can manage the unmanageable situations in our life is to accept them for what they are. Oh, I know some of y'all that's rocking your world right there. Oh, pastor, I can't just, I'm not accepting that. My faith, I, my faith will not let me just accept that because that would mean that I am denying my faith. Hello, let me ask you to take your church ears off for just a minute. Faith is not denying reality. Faith is refusing to be discouraged in the face of reality. That's what faith is. And sometimes acceptance is the first step toward peace. You might say, I don't understand it, but God, I'm going to find a way to get through it. If it's in my hands, it's mine to face. Let me tell you something. When I walked away from the fresh grave where I laid my sister and I laid my mother. When I walked away, 
I knew that all the wishing and all the faith and all the hoping and all the praying in the world was not going to bring them back. And the only way I could find the grace and the peace to keep moving is to accept it and to pray. Lord, help me to accept the things that I cannot change. The courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. That's an important key to surviving life's losses. Here's the fourth key. Remember what's important. Remember what's important. Put it all in perspective. Loss, crisis, tragedy, they all have a way of helping us put things in perspective. They help us to clarify our values. They help us to recognize the things that matter the most. Jesus said, life in Luke 12 and 15, life is not measured by how much one owns. In other words, what he's telling us is don't confuse your net worth with your self-worth. Don't, don't confuse your, your possessions with your position that you have in Christ. Don't confuse what you're living on with what you're living for. So many times we do that. He's telling us, remember when you go through these seasons of loss, you've got to identify what is really important in your life. And 2020 has caused many people to realize that the greatest things in life are not things at all. It's, it's not even about things. People are what matters. Relationships are what matter. Not things in life. First Timothy 6 and 7 tells us, you brought nothing into this world. And when I take you out, you cannot take anything with you. So if you, if you want real security in your life, if you want real security, then you got to build your life on things that cannot be taken away from you. Jobs can be taken. Positions can be taken. Health can be taken. Businesses can be taken. Your youthful beauty is going to fade and be taken away one day. But if you want a secure life, you have got to build your life on the things that cannot be taken. And that is your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody can take that relationship away from you. Uh, the, he said to us in his word, you know, I, I was thinking about this. I'll give you that scripture in just a second. But I was thinking this. Have, have, you ever, have you ever been walking and you had a kid and you were holding their hand and you got to the street and, and you were holding their hand tight, but they would try to run from you or they'd try to pull away from you. But because you love them and you don't want to see them hurt, what do you do? You just yank that hand and you pull them back into alignment. Why? They might want out of your hand, but you're not letting them out of your, uh, uh, you're not letting them out of your hand because you don't want them to get hurt. Well, the Bible says that they, God himself, is saying they are in my hands and no man can pull them out. You may want to pull away from God at times, but trust me when I tell you he's got a grip on you whether you got a grip on him or not. So put your trust in him. You grab that child because you're like, uh-uh, I can't. I'm not going to let that happen to you. I'm going to pull you back. You know why? Because that child's life matters to you. Well, God is saying your life matters to me. You might go through some losses and I might have to yank you a time or two but I only do it because I love you and I, you matter to me. That's what we got to know. We got to know what matters most in life and trouble will help us get a proper perspective. Here's the last key. Number five, we have to rely on Jesus. Rely on Jesus. Whew. Number one, we 
Release the grief. Number two, we receive from others. Number three, we refuse to be bitter. Number four, we remember what's important. And number five, is we rely on Jesus. To me, that's the secret strength that you can find in people that have survived losses in life. The Apostle Paul said in Philippians 4 and 13, I have learned the secret of being happy at any time and in everything that happens. I can do all things. So he said, first of all, he says, I have learned. So it's, it's just not automatic. But he's saying, I've learned. I've learned how to be content in all things. And I've also learned, he said, that I can do all things through Christ, which gives me the strength. Not through motivational messages or not through hyping myself up or psyching myself out or anything like that. He said, the way I have survived the losses in my life is through Christ because Christ is the one that gives me strength. You might say, Pastor Brady, so how do I, how do I rely on Christ? What do you mean by that? I'm, I'm making it s simple today because I think it's so needed. But when you find yourself facing losses in your life, losses that have just like knocked you for a loop, anybody know what that's like? You're like, what in the world? Whenever you find yourself being forced to face losses, that just knocked the wind out of you. Number one, lean on God for stability. When life knocks us off our feet, the first thing we need is something to help stabilize us. And it's always better when you lean on something that's stronger than you are. He's the one. He's the one that has the ability to stabilize you. I don't know who I'm talking to right now, but somebody has been reeling and rocking. Life has knocked you for a loop. But God wanted you to tune in right here today so you could hear me tell you. Rely on him. He's your stabilizer. Look to him. Reach for him. Psalms 125 and 1 says, the Lord gave me the scripture at the beginning of this whole pandemic. Back in March, he gave me the scripture. Those who trust in the Lord are as steady as Mount Zion. They are unmoved by their circumstances. Listen, in a crisis, we can do two things. Panic or pray. Panic or pray. That is our options. I want to read Psalms 112 to you today out of the Passion Bible. And I'm reading at verse 6. Psalms 112 and 6 out of the Passion Bible. Here's what it says. Their circumstances will never shake them. And others will never forget their example. They will not live in fear or dread of what may come. For their hearts are firm, ever secure in their faith, steady, strong. They will not be afraid, but will calmly face every foe until they all go down in defeat. Do y'all hear that? 
that's some things that God has said about us. So when you, if you find yourself because of the losses of life, if you find yourself shaking, the only thing you can do is lean on somebody that's stronger than you, and that is him. So lean on him for stability. Listen to him for direction. In Jeremiah 29 and 11, he said, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans of peace and not of evil. I've got, I've got hope in the plans for you. He's got hope in the plans for somebody that's watching me today. You're, you're, you've got plans that are filled with hope. I know that the enemy is trying to tell you something completely different, but hear me today. God is saying in Jeremiah 29 and 11, I've got plans for you and they are to prosper you and to give you a future. Remember, God's purposes for your life are always greater than your problems in life. His purposes for your life are always greater than the problems that are in your life. So lean on Him for stability. Listen to Him for direction. And look to Him for salvation. Salvation means freedom. It means liberty, deliverance. It means restoration. And it means help and wholeness. With Jesus Christ, somebody needs to hear me today. There is no situation that is too hopeless because we can do all things. Who? Through who? Through Christ that strengthens us. He is not only the hope of the world, he's the hope of your world. He's the hope of your situation. He's the hope of your family. He's the hope of whatever you are going through. And let me say this, and I'll close. When we find ourselves going through seasons of loss, sometimes it feels like they will never end. And somebody is saying that today. Pastor, will this ever end? It seems like it's one thing. Or then I, I barely get over that, and it's something else. And it's all getting to me will it ever end let me tell you something just like every other season in life this too shall pass this too shall pass hold on come on where are you get up to your screen let me see your face hold on on this season will pass sometimes it's hard when you're in the middle of it to see hope for the outcome hold on and pray cry out to God because this season will pass and in the meantime trust on him trust in him trust him to lead you to guide you, to sustain you, to uplift you, to direct you, to comfort you. Somebody might be saying right now, I don't feel, Pastor Brady, I don't even feel God. I, don't, I, can, I can't tell you how long it's been since I felt God. You know what I want to tell you to do? Just start turning your living room into a praise. Turn your, your living room into a church house. Just everywhere you go, just start praising him because he told us in his word that he inhabits the praises of his people. So wherever you are, don't, this is why your praise is so vital. Don't allow the loss to take your praise because your praise is what gives you access to God who has the power to sustain you as you go through your loss. So just give God glory in the middle of it and just say, God, it looks bad right now, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn my living room into a, a church house. And I'm going to say, unto God be all of the praise. Unto God be all of the glory. Unto God be all of the honor. If I die, let me die in the army of the Lord because I'm a soldier in his army. 
tell the devil you are a liar and God is true. He who began a good work in me. He, oh, I feel that for somebody. You better grab hold of that today. He who began the good work in you, in your spouse, in your children, in your family. He who began that good work is going to be faithful to complete it. Trust me today when I tell you. And if you don't want to trust me, don't. But trust him. Trust his word. Whatever you've been through, release the grief. Let people in that want to help you. And whatever life has took you through, refuse to be bitter. Remember what's important and rely on Jesus because he's got you. Today, if you don't know him, you need to make a decision right now to invite him into your life. Somebody is watching me and you're at the end of your rope. And you say, I, I, don't, I don't know what to do. I don't even know why I'm watching you, Pastor Brady. Because God loves you enough to yank your hand and say, hey, come this way. I want to pull you back from the traffic. I want to pull you out of a dangerous place and into my presence. Wherever you are, if you don't know Jesus, this is a great time to open up your heart and invite him to come in. If you want to be saved today, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. I've done it my way. I've let my will prevail. And today, I'm laying it all down. And I'm asking you to move in. Be the Lord of my life. Thank you for giving your life so that I could have life. And I pray this prayer today in the name of Jesus. If you prayed that prayer, you are saved today. If you believed it, when you prayed it, you are saved today. There might be a little button that you can click and you can let us know that you gave your heart to Christ. If that was you today, please click that button and, and, and we want to stay connected with you because we got a gift that we want to send you because we just want to celebrate today that you made the greatest decision you will ever make in your life. Now, let me tell you, doesn't mean things are going to be perfect, but you do have a God that you can turn to now and cry out to and that God will help you right where you are. I trust the rest of you enjoyed the word from God today. I hope you wrote those things down because I believe that they are keys that's going to help you unlock things that are trying to keep you from surviving the losses that you have faced in life. God has a plan and his plan is that of hope to give you a future. So trust him on that today.